Hello everyone and Hello. thank you for joining us today. My name is Tom from GRC World Forums and the topic for today's webinar is rethinking the marketing tech stack for data privacy. If you have any questions during the session, please submit them using the chat box and we'll aim to answer those at the end of the presentation. And this webinar is also being recorded and will be available to view on demand after the, uh, the webinar completes. Presenting the session, we have Jonathan Joseph, who's Head of Solutions and Marketing at Ketch. We have Frederick Stanichev, who is Head of Sales at Americas at Habu. So welcome, guys, and thank you for joining us. And I'd like to hand over to you to kick us off. Hey, Tom, thanks. And thanks, everybody, for joining. So we're here to talk about you know, how marketing tech stacks are evolving in the context of data privacy and the, the two key core pieces of technology that drive that. My name is Jonathan, people call me JJ. Um, I'm the uh, head of solutions and marketing at Catch, we're a privacy platform. Fred, thanks for joining. These, um, these photos of us are totally misleading and deceptive practice. I haven't worn a tie in I don't know how many years and you look sixteen there. I look younger now. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Fred, yeah, tell us about yourself and Habu and, and we'll get started on this thing. Yeah, yeah. So hi, hi everyone. So I'm the head of Sales for Americas for Habu. Um, we are a data collaboration platform. Um, so prior to Habu, I was actually at Salesforce for five years, kind of leading data and identity and North American efforts. And so privacy has actually kind of been always at the center of conversation, especially over the last three years. Um, and so kind of really glad to be here today to speak about it with you. Yeah, thanks, Fred. Looking forward to it. And don't be fooled by the ties in the photo. I think it's a pretty informal session. So for everybody here in attendance, if you have questions, just post them and we'll answer uh, all the way through. So our goals for today and kind of what we want to cover is you know, the privacy data privacy challenges that are facing marketers and how privacy practitioners are partnering with them. What, one of the trends I've seen, at least over the last year or so, is that marketers have started to join this privacy conversation. And there's a lot of places where it intersects with the work they do, you know, around brand value, around customer experience and user experience, and also just more importantly, around the use of data. Uh, so they're thinking, rethinking their data strategies, they're rethinking their uh, tech stacks. And so we'll share uh, some, some perspective on that. And then secondly, the, you know, the two pieces of technology that are reimagining re the marketing tech stack, I represent one at Catch, which is a consent management platform within a privacy platform, but we'll focus on the consent management piece. And then Fred represents you know, clean rooms. But one of the things I'd love to unpack with you, Fred, uh, during the session is, what is a clean room? What's a good way to think about it? And so we'll, we'll do that. But they're the two core pieces of technology. And then lastly, we'll talk about where some of the value and ROI is uh, with these tech investments, uh, which is important as, as you know, legal practitioners are looking for budget to enroll marketing here uh, could be a good, a good place to find that. Anything to add there, Fred? No, I think yeah. you guys. All right, cool. So. Let's get started. So we, in this slide kind of the last 30 years, you know, data management has been focused on crunching data more effectively, but I think that's probably a kind way to say it. I mean, you could also say it was kind of the wild west of data, collecting as much as we could for as long as we could. You know, you had, you had memes like data is a new oil and it was about extraction and it was about getting value, you know, and I think the next 30 years, will be more about, okay, how do you do that? But how do you do that with an understanding that you, you, you're kind of, it's, a, it's about responsible use. It's about who actually owns this data. It's a consumer. There's, a, there's an idea of data dignity for them. And the regulations are pushing people there. But I think more importantly, the consumer is emerging as a huge motivator here for brands. And so I think that, that there's a trend here where we probably skip the regulations and listen more to what the consumer is doing. So we'll talk a little about that and their perspectives on data privacy, because it's certainly leading the way with brands. But that's, I think the next 30 years will be there on, on how do you responsibly gather data. So having said that, Fred, why don't you talk a little about what's happening in the data landscape today? Yeah, no, totally. And I think you actually kind of made a great point, which is around the fact that you know, everything becomes consumer centric ecosystem, right? And so when you think about the last 30 years, everything was data was actually kind of used as a currency model, 
right? As a, that, as a, that was used as a currency and that was the model that we were actually operating on. Um, but so we've seen like big changes uh, over the last, let's say five years now around kind of the entire kind of data ecosystem. One is, first we have privacy regulation that actually kind of came online. Uh, the first one was GDPR that actually kind of made a big impact in 2018. And you know, a lot of companies, brands, marketers were to actually kind of start rethinking around the data collection and the capabilities, how to actually kind of get consent and so on. And we then had CCPA in the US, uh, I mean, California. Uh, but we see now that there is kind of a big major trend across the country to actually kind of get regulation on the way. Like I think we, today we've got about 29 states that are actually actively legislating. So this is becoming kind of a omnipresent uh, trend kind of uh, across, across the country. The other thing is we are also we, we start seeing a second iteration, right? The CCPA was the first one, or we see CPRA kind of coming uh, in January one. So the law is dynamic, and the laws are actually kind of uh, evolving and complexifying a little bit, kind of a, a data ecosystem. So that's kind of one one big component um, around the data landscape. The second one is as actually those regulations were coming on board. We've seen like the big tech companies um, kind of raising what we call wall gardens. And basically, those are platforms that are actually um, being provided to brands in order to be able to query, to query, to uh, kind of analyze data within those environments. And so, what I'm referring to here is Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, uh, the, the big four, really. Um, and they are kind of they have built those restrictions of those environments because of a privacy regulation and didn't want them to actually get up, didn't want to be exposed um, to any risk. And the la last one is also kind of a big tech driven thing, um, which is the device level identifiers. Um, so think the cookies, think the IDFAs, so the mobile advertising IDs um, are actually kind of being depreciated. Um, and that's the same thing. It's due to the sensitivity around the privacy law and the exposure that actually represents for those brands. And um, so we see that uh, being now being treated with a lot more sensitivity. And when we think about the life of a marketer, this is the world that they used to be on now for the last 30 years. And so this is a major change kind of happening in the ecosystem right now. So to that, in terms of the, uh, you know, the, world of a the world of a marketer and kind of a data access and availability, I think kind of, you know, I have a lot of empathy right now for marketers because one is the demand of being greater, you know, greater than ever uh, in a way. Like, you know, there is like a, you know, what I call the uberization of a consumer because we actually kind of now used to actually kind of get things personalized in real time. And so being kind of um, narcissistic in a way on the way that brands are actually kind of responding to us. And so marketers need to actually kind of constantly deliver to this. That being said, as we kind of you know, talked about, like those privacy regulations are actually kind of creating a big pressure on the data access and the data availability, meaning it's more difficult to actually access it because you need to actually get to different systems to kind of make sure you can analyze and um, there's more privacy. So you need to take, be, take into account consent and kind of the, the level of data that is available to you. And so you actually kind of have a data deficit which doesn't actually enable you to personalize the way that you might want to. Um, and at the same time, you have an increasing demand. And so I think that's making the job of marketers a lot more kind of challenging right now. Um, and so that's why like there is this next iteration of privacy market. Yeah, and Fred, you know, the kind of the last bullet there, one of the things to add is, you know, marketers and brands are always looking to share values with consumers, right? Like, hey, we care about diversity. Hey, we care about sustainability, right? And they kind of connect with those values-based consumers. One of the things I've seen now appearing on that list of shared values is data privacy. And this is kind of near to our point earlier. It's a brand value you want to share. It's it's a way to connect with consumers. And if you can build that trust, you start to reduce that data deficit that's coming when third-party cookies go away. And so we'll, we'll talk about how to do that 
when you build trust through a CMP, through a privacy platform, but also how do you address the data deficit through collaboration tools like a clean room? And so we'll, we'll address some of that. Um, but I wanted to dig down a little on this, on this idea of the consumer and how they fit, you know, because it's important as you talk about the marketing tech stack to, I mean, the consumer is essentially at, at the center of that. So Fred, you talked about, you know, this data deficit and these challenges that marketers have specifically in data privacy, this complexity as well. You mentioned the complexity in regulations, tremendous complexity in the systems that we use. I think on average, the marketing tech stack, you'll see it when we share it in a second, but there's something like 50 or 60 on average vendors in the average marketing tech stack. And so when a consumer makes a choice, opt out, opt in, some kind of privacy choice, whatever that is, one of the big pieces of the privacy market that has been missing is this idea that you need to orchestrate that consent throughout that that system, throughout that tech stack. And so we'll, we'll talk about that. That's one of the key things you should look for in CMPs. And so this idea that consumers know about this and they care about it, given that brands have such complexity in dealing with data privacy, it creates this chasm. It creates this chasm between you and your consumer and this kind of inability to connect. So what I what we'll do now is we'll go through a little so a study that we did with IPG and media brands that talks a little on how consumers feel about this to kind of set the context. And uh, for those that want it, this this study is available to, to anybody. We can send it after the call. But we asked consum U.S. consumers and U.K. consumers, by the way, those two reports. Uh, the re the results were similar. Firstly, we asked how how much do they value their data privacy, and we also asked. You know, how, how highly would you value sustainability? How highly would you value diversity and inclusion? And one of the interesting pieces of this study is <clears throat> data privacy had a broader appeal. There was more people that said, I value data privacy as an eight, nine, or 10 out of 10 in terms of how I value uh, these shared values that, that brands typically go after. Not that data privacy is more important than sustainability. The way to think about these stats is that more people care about it. And I think it's more of a personal issue. And so the key takeaway for me is as a brand who is, is involved in all the move, all the social movements around diversity and inclusion, is involved in all the social movements around sustainability, you're investing in those things, you're flagging, you're virtue signaling around those things. And what we're saying is you should be doing the same for data privacy. You should be saying, I care about this. I care about your data dignity. And so the idea is if you do that, it's one of the core ways to generate trust with your consumers. And what we'll share in a second is that there's going to be benefits to that. So, so firstly, even, so even the people that people care about their data privacy, they're concerned about how brands are gathering that data and how they're using it. They care about it. They're concerned about how it's treated. And the things they're specifically worried about is, I don't know what brands are doing with my data. There's a lack of transparency at data collection, at kind of uh, what flows through through the data value chain, through the data life cycle. <clears throat> and then secondly, they're worried about the lack of control they have over their data. This idea that opt-outs may not, may not always be honored and they're not honored throughout the ecosystem. So we'll talk about how to address that. Uh, so that was a key point. But here's what was super interesting. Even though consumers are con concerned about how their data is being treated, they see the value in sharing data with brands. So they're almost like, hey, I value my data privacy. I'm concerned about how you're handling my data. But I understand, like Fred, you mentioned that data is a currency. And I think that's a, such a great word because it is currency in this value exchange that happens between a brand and a consumer. And Basically, what's behind that value exchange, we asked, like, why would you share data with a brand? And people said, look, I, I get it. I get that there's a value exchange. I'm going to receive a benefit. It could be a discount. I'm going to get a personalized experience. I'm going to learn about new products. And this list kind of went on and on. The point is, people understand that there's a value exchange. And they're not really saying, I don't want to share data. They're saying, I want to share data. I just need you to treat it right. And so if you did treat it right, and by treat it right, what do we mean? We, you know, we, there's, there's a lot of principles in GDPR and other data privacy legislation 
that talks about what it means to have responsible data practices. And <clears throat> to summarize, and there's more than these, but essentially, you know, firstly, this idea that you're collecting the right amount of data for the use case or for the processing purpose. And some people talk, you know, refer to this as data minimization. I think it's more of a case of like data relevancy. You know, let, let brands decide how many data points they need to sell shampoo, or kind of do whatever they need to do. And so what we ask consumers here is, you know, are brands collecting just kind of the right amount of data? And what we found is people were really sensitive to what you're collecting or what you're using it for. And they, they understood at a pretty nuanced level that there's some data points you just shouldn't need to, to drive marketing. And I was surprised how sensitive they were to that. When we did this, uh, you know, I should note when we ran the study, it was before Roe v. Wade being overturned. So it was before this sensitivity around location data. And I bet you if we ran it again, there'd be even more sensitivity around it. Secondly, uh, a responsible data practice was you know, the level of transparency that you're providing. What are you doing with data? Who are you sharing it with? Like this was kind of really came up as a big thing when consumers were asked about what is a responsible data practice. Lastly, and this was huge in the US, transparency was huge in the UK. In the US, this idea of you know, how long are you keeping data? the retention period, right? And when we talk about the wild west of data collection, you'd collect as much as you could, you'd store it for as long as you could with this idea that it maybe it'll come in handy, right? Consumers are saying, no, kind of keep, keep the data for the length of time you need to do the thing you promised me you would do and not for a second longer. And that was a huge driver of some really important marketing KPIs like purchase intent and brand value for consumers if brands were able to demonstrate that they could do this. And then lastly, data sharing. People were cool with data sharing uh, across different vendors, but you know, they wanted to be able to control that. And they wanted to be able to say, to see the transparency in that data sharing and be able to control kind of where it goes. So there's, there's this idea that you're controlling data across the life cycle. And that data is permissioned and consumers have control over it. And this idea that consumers have control is interesting. Because we're not saying that people want to be presented with a whole list of things that they can opt in and out of. I think at some level they want to trust you, but they want to go back and be able to make changes and control their data if they need to. And so I think brands will find a balance between convenience and you know, kind of reducing consent fatigue and whatnot as they do this. But to get to the money slide, if you can do all that, the reward for brands is tremendous. So we asked consumers, you know, if a brand was doing all this, if they were transparent with their data practices, if they, you know, had appropriate retention schedules, if they gave you control and transparency over your data, what would you give brands in return? And what they'll give you is basically revenue. And so when we measured this, <clears throat> we found that the consume the brands with responsible data practices will drive 23% more purchase intent. And purchase intent has been an is, is, has been an age old uh, you know marketing KPI that has a direct connection to revenue, and depending on what type of brand you are, you that twenty three percent filters down into an actual revenue growth number. You know, fast sales cycles, durable goods. You you might get seventy five percent of that flow through to revenue, but at least fifteen percent of it's flowing through. So you could imagine a three to four percent impact on revenue if you do this right. And so, Fred, to take it back to you know the data deficit, marketers are dealing with less data as third-party data goes away. But the idea here is that, well, how do you build your first-party data assets? But also, how do you build trust? Because if you build trust, even though you, the data volume is going away, you can build, build it so that your data uh, value increases, you know, the quality of data rather than its quantity. And if you do that through trust, through collaboration, you're going to get this long-term impact on revenue. Yeah, we, it's in, you know, we really came from a quantitative role, the world to a qualitative world, right? And that's, that's kind of really sanitizing the entire kind of data ecosystem and so marketing practice. So I think actually there's a lot of opportunity there for kind of marketers just to kind of take advantage of that kind of consolidated first party data. Um, and we haven't talked decarbonization and the, no, the impact on the environment around processing too much data, uh, which is another topic for another yeah. day. But, yeah. Well, so how do we address the data deficit? Let's talk about that. 
How do we build trust? How do we grow with data? We're going to show the marketing text, a typical marketing text stack here. And it's an eye chart. Or it's not intended that we go through all of these. But you'll have this deck uh, and you can kind of go through it. But we wanted to kind of point your attention to kind of some key features of this and kind of where our technologies play. So for example, consent management platforms, which we're talking about today in clean rooms, are the two new pieces of tech that are rolling through the marketing tech stack. And so we'll talk through their roles. But firstly, Fred, let's talk about the, if you can, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but this left side of the equation, the data that feeds the tech stack, what's happening there? Because if I heard you right, third party data is the thing that's going away, right? Yeah, that's correct. I think, you know, basically when we spoke about cookies from third party cookies, um, kind of depreciating. So Google, so Google Chrome is basically not going to support third party cookies, uh, certainly by 2024 is to be confirmed, but that's the anticipated timeline. Um, also Apple through Safari actually doesn't support third party cookies. And so that means that basically all of a sudden, of a third party data ecosystem, especially for anything related to you know, digital advertising that depreciate completely. I think, you know, if you take kind of a, both browsers, I think you were talking about 86% of market share. So we see kind of third party data kind of completely depreciating, um, but then to the benefit of second party data, where basically now a marketer might actually kind of get insights uh, from a partner company, you know, a marketer that we might actually uh, are partnering with to go and get additional um, attributes around the audience that they're actually addressing. Um, so much more kind of direct collaboration. And to your point earlier around like the first party data quality, um, I think here that actually enables kind of really marketers to really access much higher quality um, data sets and therefore kind of being more efficient. Yeah, Fred, to, to unpack these, I mean, we've got people in the audience here with all, all sorts of different kind of knowledge about how advertising works. But tell me if this is right. An example of third party data is you, some publisher, whoever it might be, <clears throat> who has a website that might be targeted to moms, would say, hey, someone's been engaging with a lot of this content around, I don't know, fashion, style, whatever. So, you know, we think they're into this brand or we think they're into these kinds of t-shirts, whatever the case may be. And basically that, that's an input to a, to a segment, but it doesn't come from your website. It doesn't come from the brand's website. It comes from somewhere else. And it's usually publishers because they're looking at content you're engaging with, right? And that they're tracking you around the web and they're kind of making influences on who you are, what you're about, what you like. I think yeah, two, two points you, you mentioned that are truly accurate. One is aggregation, right? So it's like vast amounts of collections. So you're unsure of where the collection happened, unsure about the source. And then um, to kind of your point here, there's a lot of inferences to the data. So you, you model this out so that you can actually kind of get scale. Um, so that's those are the two kind of main And points. then the first party data is data that as a brand I've collected directly from you. And actually it's a, it's a really important point because let's just say wherever I'm in a L'Oreal Sephora website and I said, you know, here are the types of makeup that I like. And this is a, this is a, this is an exchange between a person, a consumer and the brand that's first party data. Second party data is when I'm using somebody else's first party, right? Is, is kind of the, one of the best ways I think about it. And Fred, you'll, you'll go into one of the, into the use cases here, because this is a kind of a core part of clean room collaboration technology. But one of the best examples for me is if you're L'Oreal or Sephora, and let's just say you kind of, you're a consumer goods company. And so you're running yeah. you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of marketing spend, and you've got your segments and you think you know who your consumer is. And so you target them with these, with these uh, messages and across different channels and whatnot. And then that person responds to those ads walks into a store and buys your product when they buy your product they're buying it from a retailer and when they do yeah. that you actually if you're l'oreal you actually lose visibility on who's actually bought right i mean you see revenue numbers and you see all that stuff but you don't know that it was fred as, as an example who bought that product and so 
one of the one of my favorite use cases for a clean room is you can actually retailers and consumer goods companies come together and say let me complete the customer journey for you right well some people call attribution yeah totally and i think i mean this is actually kind of changing the way that attribution has actually kind of you know, being kind of measured over the last decades and um, because of that lack of trustability in a way from all technology like you know, the, the third party cookie um, and then therefore much more relying on the data ecosystem that is decentralized in a way um, and so that that way the data collaboration is a must uh, a must have and um, hey I wanted to kind of go on the data management piece here because I, I think you know it is interesting kind of the way we're thinking about the different technologies out there um, and especially when you think about concept management being the input um, to a lot of those different technologies I think you now we see here the kind of a description of a lot of technologies that were part of the previous cycle of technologies in a way and now are they going to be part of the next cycle is actually kind of to to be questioned for some of it because privacy becoming such a foundational information point in terms of you know data around the consumer like you need to make sure that it leads into all those places in a way and uh, so that you know you can actually kind of go and use them so we can speak about use cases but i think there is actually some um redundancy that actually happens in that stack here that we have below between you know, the customer data platform that is here to centralize and provide a UI and then the, the data lake that is here to kind of be the overarching database around all of consumer data and I think that people are now kind of starting questioning some you know, some part of the stack. Yeah it's a good point Fred so you know, we talked about what gets added to this but you're saying there's pieces of this that potentially get removed. Yeah I mean Potentially, I mean, I think it depends on the use cases, but it's like, how do we actually think about privacy being taken into account into kind of the stack and where does that leave? And then based on where does that leave, like what solution do you actually need? Um, and not kind of overcomplicate also kind of the way that you are, your marketing. And a good example is if you can apply a segmentation engine on top of your data warehouse, you might not need a CDP. Potentially, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's let's dig in on the new pieces. So I'm going to talk a little about consent management, and you'll talk about data clean rooms, Fred, which I'm keen to hear because like clean rooms is such it can be a vague term, right? So I know you're going to unpack. Well, here's what it actually is. Yeah, super vague, super trendy right it's now. It's super hot. Yeah, no, totally. So in consent managers, well, okay, maybe I wonder if they're sexy because they've been around for a long time. But one of the one of the Kind of points i wanted to make here is actually the consent management game has changed and so if you imagine this data flowing through this tech stack that data flowing through this tech stack now needs to be permissioned it needs to be responsibly gathered and so we all know consent managers on the front end you know basically give you the option to say here's, here's what i'm going to do with the data do i have consent to do that but one of the things they haven't done, a lot of legacy privacy tech hasn't done, is then be able to orchestrate that consent into all the systems that it needs to. So you imagine you have a, a set of responsibly gathered data and you know the permissions mm -hmm. for that data. You know for Fred Stanachev, he's okay with analytics, he's okay with targeted advertising. The core part is called orchestration, which is this idea that you can take that permission data set and you can understand what Fred has consented to and not jurisdictionally aware on when it needs to be an opt-out, when it needs to be an opt-in, all flowing down to this idea of permitted use and flowing that through this whole tech stack. And that's going to be one of the most important roles of a consent manager, not just to capture consent, but to actually be able to orchestrate it. So I want to dig in on that point a little bit as we talk about consent managers. Firstly, a little on catch just to give you, give you some context. Our idea, our whole mission is that you know, we're going to give businesses the power to be responsible stewards of data. So this idea that you control data end to end, it's responsibly gathered, it's always aware of consumer permissions, so you can build trust with consumers, but at the same time, you can compete in these data-driven markets, right? You have the permission data set that lets you do that. And while you do that, we're going to, we're going to collapse some of those costs, a lot of those costs that come with you know, some of the complexity that you mentioned, Fred, around, around privacy. So where a consent manager fits in a, in a privacy suite, you know, we're, we're kind of focused on consent management, but it's part of a suite that includes data discovery and classification. You know, consent managers, in a way, 
uh, are across new data that you're collecting, but you've got data sitting in databases all across your organization. So the data discovery and classification tools have changed in the sense that they're no longer surveys. They're no longer, hey, Fred, what kind of data assets do you have under your purview in your department? And can you tell me that? And I'll just plug it into a spreadsheet. The way data discovery happens now, it's automated. It's connected to those data systems wherever they are in, in a distributed fashion. And it tells you, here's the data you have. Here's what types of data it is. You know, it's sensitive. It's personal. Based on those definitions that you'll need jurisdiction by jurisdiction, but also this is a social security number. This is an email address. This is a whatever, which becomes important as you kind of think about what do I have and what am I using it for? The important connection with consent and preference managers is this ability to say, I can use Fred's data for analytics, but I can't use it for targeted advertising. And how do you append that signal to the data that you have? And so at, at Catch, we do that. And with there's some underlying technology here, which is a permit or a permission vault that then permeates through our APIs across all your systems. And then, of course, there's DSRs, fulfillment, and that, that we'll talk about. But really, that's the crux of consent. And so one of the, one of the kind of things I wanted to really, really talk about here in the context of the marketing tech stack, and apologies for this wordy slide, but if you want, we can read out this essay. But the gist of it is, it's not just about capturing consent. It's actually about being able to orchestrate that consent across all those systems that you saw in that marketing tech stack. And to do that, you need the APIs, you need the applications and infrastructure to do that. And so that's been a key movement here. So when folks are looking at CMPs and consent management platforms, I hope they're asking this question because it's easy to, to capture consent. It's not as easy. And a lot of the, a lot of the kind of legacy consent managers actually don't do this orchestration. And you can see that with global privacy controls. You can see that with some of these privacy strings that the IAB is working is that a lot of privacy vendors aren't there yet in, in being able to orchestrate that. And that's a kind of a key piece to look for. You hear some horror stories where consent is being, you know, kind of downloaded into a spreadsheet and sent to media agencies so they can actually understand what the state of permission data is. I mean, those days are gone. This needs to happen programmatically. So it's a really important thing to look for. And so there's this idea that you should be able to deploy privacy technology and it basically can flow through, be able to be, be aware of every regulation. Where is, when is sensitive data different on the GDPR and the different US state legislations? Mm -hmm. You talked a little, Fred, about identity and being able to understand across all these different digital identities that people have, mobile IDs, cookies, web IDs, you know, over the top television becoming a thing to be able to kind of reflect consent across all those channels as well. So if somebody on a, on a, on a TV app says, I consent or I no longer consent, that that gets reflected across all the channels that that person is working. That's a critical piece of infrastructure. And of course, there's this idea that you can send consent and permits into every system, into clean rooms, into CRM, into marketing automation tools. Because uh, the, the days of just kind of having data and not knowing what the permission is, I think they're gone. And to kind of summarize some of the things to look for, all data collection will be responsible. Like all data collection will be, will have a view to what consumer permission is, what you can and can't do with it. And then secondly, it's not just about that you collect it and you kind of know, you need to be able to enforce that permitted use. And so one of the key themes that has been coming up and, and in the context of clean rooms as well, right, Fred? So do, that you've collected data for a specific purpose. That purpose might be analytics, it might be targeted advertising. And when you start to use that data for a secondary purpose, that's usually, I mean, not being a lawyer, but usually that's where you start to get into trouble. When you use data for less than its intended purpose. So this idea of consent orchestration, one of the areas where it becomes really important is a key principle on the GDPR, which they call purpose limitation. How am I able to actually collect data for a that I know was only collected for a specific purpose and I have permission to do that. And I need to make sure that no one in my organization can use that data for something else. That's the gist of purpose limitation. And, and when you look at CMPs that have consent orchestration built in, not just consent capture, they solve for that. 
And so that this I would, I would leave folks when they think about uh, consent managers to think about them that way. Are they orchestrating? Can they uh, actually you know limit the purpose to which it's used? So it's not so it's the primary purpose and not the secondary purpose. That's a very really com complex problem to solve, right? It's like when you think about like the all the systems that are actually in the enterprise, like all the different departments, the different regions. Like, I'm, I'm not sure how you actually can solve that, but that's a, yeah, that's a, that's a really complex. Problem. Yeah, no, thanks, Fred. So we well, we've solved it through these APIs into all of these systems essentially, uh, and on the front end, we've built it to be jurisdictionally aware. You know, here are the here are the here are the data pieces that apply to this law. Here's the type of consent legal basis you need. And when I say consent. I'm kind of saying it in the broadest possible terms. It's not just about opt-in and opt-out. It could be, well, I showed a disclosure, so I'm permitted to use this, you know, or it's this is an opt-out environment and they haven't opted out yet. So there's a permitted use there. Or it could even be, you know, you have a legitimate interest in keeping that data. So it's still permitted. It doesn't always need a signal from the consumer. But I'm, I'm keen to kind of learn about clean rooms too. So let's roll through that. All right, so that's my turn here. All right, so, all right, so basically, uh, no, we, we just did a, a survey just to kind of uh, share a little bit about the lay of the land today in, in data collaboration. And so we actually surveyed about 266 <laughs> marketers to be accurate. And you know, we, we had a really positive response that basically 78% were actually kind of planning on collaborating with other companies, whether they are other marketers and they partner with going to market, whether those are media companies that they're actually advertising with, or whether those are data partners um, that might actually kind of help them um, kind of augment and enrich kind of the data. And so to that, I think, you know, th that positive response of 78% was mainly because of the data deficit that we were talking about earlier and there needs to be an alternative um, to the access of third-party data that was kind of widely available in the past and so now there's actually kind of a concentration towards data collaboration to actually kind of bridge the gap so that that's a, a stand that we were actually kind of super pleased on seeing um, and that was actually kind of, kind of collected earlier this year so like when we think about 78%, that was like six, six months ago, hopefully that has actually kind of increased since then. Um, but though when we speak about the collaboration, like, you know, we need to recognize that we are also kind of in the early innings um, of kind of those data collaboration because it's a new um, kind of trend, a new, a new thing that people need to get accustomed to. Um, and so when they actually kind of start digging in, we actually kind of understand that there are five main challenges. And um, the first one is actually privacy. And you know why it's actually privacy? Because all marketers want to be comfortable with the fact that they can use the data for the purpose that it's meant to. And um, so, and now having the proper tools to do that. But also, you know, I think there's actually a concern about making sure that the data that they, that they have do not leave their walls and you now there is kind of a strong element there around making sure that you you have this control around where the data goes because should you know you have data movement and creating data leakage and you might actually expose your company to much more than what the benefits you were supposed to experience so that's kind of the first uh, the first one two now early innings in terms of data collaboration. So the readiness of partners and the access to data were actually going up a number two and number three blockers. I want to actually kind of pay attention to this because I think there is actually kind of a trend that we have observed that is actually kind of really interesting where, yes, we are in early days. That being said, the first movers right now in the data collaboration space are actually major companies that have high quality data signals that they can actually enable their partners with. And so you know, I'll take as an example, like one of the biggest media companies of the world, um, Disney, is actually actively doing the collaboration with a ton of the advertisers that, they, that are actually advertising within the property. And the thing is, 
that actually enables those advertisers to one collaborate on data but that also enables them to get an edge on competition because they are also a first mover so we can you know, better understand the audience better understand their behaviors better understand how they actually kind of go and and convert those either kind of net new customers to the brand or even kind of customers that they actually kind of need to retain and um, so that this is a thing where now I, I think kind of the you know we are in the early earnings or we're in the early adopting phase if you are kind of familiar with the, the chasm here in terms of technology adoption um, but I think we're going to go pretty rapidly right now we're seeing an acceleration in terms of more data being available more partners being ready to actually kind of have a right safe mechanism and so the fourth point is actually technology and so that's where we got, we're going to go next is around like showing you what, what data clean rooms are actually kind of meant to do and how they actually kind of enable to make sense of um, all the data that you can actually access to you know, see an aggregated view and make enough intelligent decisions. So what's a data clean room? That was your question, JJ. Um, so data clean rooms, basically, you know, the, the way to think about it is that it's a data collaboration platform, an interoperable data collaboration platform that allows two companies or more to actually share data in a safe and private privacy safe way. Right? That that's what it's meant is meant to do. Um, and so as we think about the, the technical rooms, there's actually kind of a few things here that are actually kind of important. Uh, one is kind of the, the data input. So what is actually kind of feeding the clean room where actually we we're talking about earlier, like the high data quality, the consent um, kind of um, permission is actually also potentially kind of an input. Then you have on the two data sets can actually be read at where it is and then join together but just you now what is meant to be joined here to actually kind of process and run analysis so that basically it creates an output and its output is an analytics that is then shared between the two parties so i know it's a lot of like complicated words <laughs> in a way there but basically kind of not taking that into kind of use case so and a simple use case is say for instance you have an advertiser that have data around the customers around people that are actually buying regularly from them. And you have on the other side, a media company that has data around the number of time you know, people are actually being exposed to an advertisement. And basically the data collaboration platform or data clean room here enables the advertiser and the publisher to create a joint data set for those existing customers that were on the media property and understand how many how and exposure so you know, the number of times those, those consumers were actually exposed to an ad contributed for those customers to either buy one time or buy more of those advertiser product so that's what it's meant to do it's really kind of enabling data sharing um but is this why i sorry i hear you talk about it as a collaboration tool rather than, you know because i think yeah I mean, months ago, when I hear people talk about clean rooms, they they had a misconception that what clean rooms are doing is it, you're throwing data in, and somehow they're making that data privacy safe. That's not the idea. The idea is the data going in should be privacy safe. It should have the right permissions. You understand the legal context on when to commingle, when to combine data. Which, by the way, I mean July first, the the combination of data under uh, CPRA starts to become enforceable. So there's kind of this, this legal piece of this as well. But the idea is data is coming in privacy safe with the right permissions. You're combining it in a place that keeps that safe, essentially for the two people that have, two brands that have contributed that data, but then they get rights back. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think when you think about looking at data clean rooms from a kind of privacy lens, right? Like how does that play a role into kind of the data privacy landscape? one is it actually kind of enables both parties to share data without movement or duplication of the data 
meaning you don't create a copy of your data set and then send it over, or you don't actually kind of move it into a room uh, and kind of join it with somebody else in the, into one place. So this is actually to really kind of prevent any leakage or kind of data corruption. And so that's the first thing. Then two, it's about the governance of the data. So what is the what am I sharing with the other party? Who are the people that will actually kind of be able to see what the outcome is? Like all of this is actually kind of managed through the governance layer, um, and as well as kind of the, the encryption, if you'd like, when you when you are able to actually share data with a um, potential partner. How do you actually encrypt the data and just to make to make sure that this is actually kind of secure while it's actually kind of being processed? And three is really kind of the minimization of the persons of the data because the goal is really to kind of create an output, right? And an analytics, a reporting that both parties can actually benefit from. But when the after that output is actually being created, the clean room should actually kind of be able to eliminate kind of any join any joint data so that they can't leave kind of any further in a way so it's really about kind of you know, minimizing any disruption uh, and making sure that from a data privacy standpoint um you, know, you are kind of minimizing any risk there all right so actually let me go here so well, when we think about data clean room so we kind of talked about the general principles um, of, media, of a clean rooms, but they are actually kind of a lot of confusion right now because this is a new term um, that has been kind of used, that is being used for different kind of context. And so when you think about you know, the, the different type, one you have what we call data enrichment. So those are actually kind of data enrichment um, companies that are in the marketing data business um, and have been actually for decades at this point that want to actually kind of still enable uh, brands and marketers to still use the marketing database, but while kind of you know, being privacy conscious. And so this is actually the first category here where you have you know, a few companies like Newstar or Miracle that really kind of enable the advertiser to share its data and then do an enrichment um, while actually kind of you know, preserving privacy. The, the second one, I think, is kind of where the term really emerged and kind of got some tailwind in a way, is what we call the media clean rooms. So we, we spoke about earlier, um, you know, Amazon, Google, um, Apple, like all the big tech taking some big measures from a privacy standpoint. And so here, like those media clean rooms are literally kind of environments that are provided by um, those advertising media um, companies to enable marketers and brands to just run analysis on the campaigns they have been actually running on those environments and doing this with a privacy safe way. So really kind of here, the, clean, the media clean rooms were created so that Google, Meta or Amazon are actually kind of protecting themselves in a way from any privacy regulations um, and they actually kind of are doing so by infusing a few privacy techniques uh, into the clean rooms and then you have pure play and so actually you know selfishly this is kind of where habu plays a role here uh, where the pure play are really about data collaboration right it's software to actually kind of enable two parties to share data um, it's extremely flexible where no, any part so of the parties need to bring their own data. They can also kind of bring their own identity um, kind of component. They could also bring their own kind of consent data to the mix here uh, in order to be able to actually kind of run analysis, a joint analysis between the two parties and then create an output. So this is kind of where you know, I think the clean rooms, like latest, uh, I would say, uh, trend and topic are is actually much more that data collaboration component. And so I'll, I'll go into this kind of right now. So when you think about the data collaboration platform, they are actually kind of providing um, some privacy enhancing techniques. And so I just kind of listed here a few examples about kind of what the Internet Advertising Bureau has kind of been 
declaring as privacy enhancing techniques within the advertising marketplace and how this needs to actually cannot be reflected into the tech collaboration platform that marketers and brands are actually kind of using with the, the media counterparts or data counterparts that we want to collaborate with. So one you have what we call a, a secure multi-party computation. What it means is that two parties can actually share data, not learn from any from you know, anything from the other party data set, but then run a common query, so come an indirect question per se on that data set to get the analysis. So that's kind of what we, we talked about earlier. This is the most common way, most common framework um, you know, currently within the data collaboration platform. The, the other one is um, what we call a trusted execution environment. So this is kind of going a little bit further um, into kind of you know, privacy um, as techniques where here basically the processing of the data is actually happening on a secure hardware uh, or encrypted hardware. So basically the data needs to leave into the same hardware as soon as it leaves the, the cent central server, for instance, um, it's, it's actually kind of being, uh, being encrypted. And then you have other things like you know, computing on edge. So it's on device learning uh, where the data is actually being processed on the device per se, not as a batch as it used to be. And then you have differential privacy techniques. And those are actually kind of some of those techniques are used uh, in the media clean rooms where it's about randomize some of the data so that you know, basically you block from any re-identification of a specific user. And, and two is about kind of cohorts. So making sure that any result um, of any query or analysis will not be below segments of let's say 100 people or 200 people. So that, that prevents from any re-identification and kind of really pre preserving privacy of individuals. So those are kind of you know, all the techniques here. And so I'm you know, happy to kind of go deeper, but I, and kind of offset of that forum if uh, somebody's interested. And so just kind of ramp up on, on the clean rooms, um, you've got several use cases in terms of how clean rooms, that clean rooms can actually be leveraged. Some that actually kind of directly related to advertising, as you know, as we talked about, and then some others that actually kind of more uh, enterprise focus. Um, and so I just kind of gathered a few examples here, just to kind of go briefly about them. Um, first, uh, global media company where you actually kind of uh, this company is enabling the brands that it's working with to actually share their own consumer files and actually understand what the overlap between the brand consumer and the audience of that media company is to actually then understand what is actually the addressable audience uh, when this company wants to advertise or whether they actually kind of want to do lookalike modeling or activation per se. And another one, another use case is actually kind of more related to CPG. It's really about kind of unifying data coming from a set of retailers to actually kind of really understand how consumers are buying the product and where they're buying the product and what type of customers are buying which product to actually then inform um, marketing strategy um, where it's actually you know, the messaging um, that this brand is actually kind of putting to market um, as well as kind of a product strategy within kind of those kind of geolocation. <laughs> So sorry. This is what yeah. happens when you have devices to your computer. Um, <laughs> one second, I'm gonna take this call. Yeah. <laughs> and so then yeah, then I had another two uh where basically you have um lead, no a retailer that is now for the first time able to actually kind of share transaction data with the brands. So that's a massive kind of retailer here in the US that were ne that was never sharing data with its own uh, CPG company and of their CP CPG clients. 
And the fact that now they are feeling comfortable because of the security and the privacy techniques that they can actually sort of share that data so that it informs the CPG companies about what audience to target, how to message to them um, down the line. And the last one is a kind of luxury brand and kind of getting insights in terms of um, the advertising on Amazon as a specific kind of endpoint and kind of understanding here customer lifetime value. So those are like, no, just kind of a brief around kind of use cases. And you no, know, I wish we had more time to actually kind of go and unpack those because I can actually kind of take, take a while, but uh, no, they are multiple, the key point is there are multiple applications across the enterprise. And this is actually that never happened before. And this is because of privacy and unseen techniques being implemented into the data collaboration platform that this is now coming to load. To awesome. Us. Thanks, Fred. Yeah, it's funny. It's, we used to talk about these use cases years ago. <laughs> and it's amazing how I guess the catalyst for these to start to happen now is this people are worried about data going away, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's as simple as that. Um, yeah. Awesome. So actually, Fred, did you want to go through these? I was going to just hit the ROI piece and we can go, we take questions. We've got a few minutes left. Yeah, I mean, basically, you know, the, the key thing is that there has been a tectonic change, you know, in terms of what happens into the marketing landscape and kind of mainly kind of with privacy driving uh, those changes. And so now, like, you know, the data, is t data has been, is still there. And like, look, like, we shouldn't forget that actually consumers have never been producing as much data as they are today, right? Because, I mean, we all interface with our mobile phone all the time. Uh, but now it's actually kind of remain is distributed and is decentralized, um, and so basically clean rooms now operate uh, in that kind of decentralized data world and really kind of enable um, companies to actually kind of go and have a central place where they can actually can make make sense of all those data silos, um, and so that's that's the way that you know we see now the first movers kind of adapting um those technologies and the key thing is how do you actually kind of get started is you get started by starting small identifying a key partner and start collaborating this will actually kind of drive values uh, straight away thanks Fred. well we said we we're going to talk about roi so let's close on this but there's as you kind of collaborate collaborate <laughs> across your organization um this there's, there's a lot of levels of value one of those levels levels of value, of course, I mean, there are compliance costs that are ridiculous when you think about how many jurisdictions you need to comply with and, and how much manual workload there is around some of these privacy functions. So the world has moved away from these legacy solutions that are workflow based, that are survey based into more programmatic approaches. And we've seen compliance costs be cut by 80%. I mean, it's huge, which saves time so you can do other more important things. We talked about purchase intent, you do this right, you figure out, you know, how to kind of manage this data strategy, how to kind of reinvigorate your tech stack, how to build trust with your consumers. There's a direct tie to revenue there uh, uh, with this increase in purchase intent. And of course, if you're dealing with this data deficit, Fred, collaboration is a way to increase this first party data asset grow conver conversions. And then if, you, if you're really doing consent management well and it's integrated with your data discovery, you can use that data a little better. You can use it, you can find use cases, you're doing it with permission data, and you start to unlock you know, a lot of those use cases that you kind of walk through, Fred, ways to generate value out of data. Because the idea is that you are respecting people's data dignity, but also you're getting utility out of data where you're participating in the data-driven economy. So as you do that, I mean, it's a team sport, right? Bring your marketing people into CMP, consent management conversations and you mark it's marketers who are having these clean room conversations with you right Fred so it's uh let's work through the legal issues on both I mean clean rooms have pretty specific legal considerations and things you got to think about consent managers do as well so it's a nice opportunity for legal and marketing to collaborate on that key takeaway on consent managers it's not just about the capture it's about orchestration and clean room Fred I, I love this idea that it adds quality uh, in addition to quantity of your data assets so you can activate and measure more effectively. Tom, I don't know if we have time for a question or two, but if we do, let's, uh, let's go to those. One minute to go, guys. Thank you for that. And the first question I wanted to ask was um, how to get started and how to be set for success. 
Jay, did you want to start or do you want to start? No, go for it, Fred. Um, yeah. I'll speak from a, a, a kind of a habu standpoint, but I think the the way is actually kind of to to start simple, meaning just identify one use case, one desired outcome, clear owners around um, who is going to go and, and execute and set up the data collaboration. Select one partner, go and get started. There's going to be positive outcome out of what you know out of it. And so that's just about simplifying the way to go about it. Yeah, for us, Fred, I think the, the, the attitude is you kind of evaluate privacy tech vendors to think about who who can actually control data across life cycles. Um, that's where you, un where you unlock the value. It's collaborative. So it's, it's important to have multiple stakeholders kind of in the room as you have these conversations. And look, quite frankly, we're in an environment where there's a uh, someone has picked up a lot of market share with one trust. And so we've built at catch a way to migrate any consent data you have in one trust uh, directly into, into catch. And so you can start these programmatic approaches easier. Okay, guys, thank you for that. And unfortunately, I think we're out of time, but any more questions from the audience, we can take those off air and uh, I'll share these presentation slides in a follow-up email and also on the platform just now. So thank Thanks, you both. Tom your time and uh, we look forward to welcome you again very soon thank you thanks everybody thanks Fred. everyone bye-bye cheers bye-bye